<laughs> okay, good morning, everyone. Let's dive right back in. We are making our way through the 10 assignments that will set you up for your final project, just to orient the undergrads and graduates as to where you are and where you're going. As we're setting up our evolutionary, our evolutionary robotics experimental platform, you're working your way through, at the moment, putting together all the bits and pieces that make up your simulated robot running around in its virtual environment. The robot itself is made up of physical objects called links. Uh, you just finished the assignment on joints, which are the invisible objects in the physics engine that connect pairs of links together. That was assignment three. Uh, a few of you pointed out a few things that were a little bit confusing about joints. I'll come back in a moment to just refresh and reinforce some of those concepts. Undergraduates in assignment four, uh, which you're gonna be working on this week, you're going to be leaving the physics engine behind in the sense that you're going to now start to add on some additional bits and pieces that are simulated inside the physics engine that the physics engine itself doesn't really deal with. So everything above this line, this sort of comes default with the physics engine. In order to simulate a robot in a physics engine, you're gonna to have to simulate some additional things inside that physics engine, such as the sensors, which pull information in for the robot from its virtual environment. In assignment four, you're gonna be working with two Python packages, NumPy and Matplotlib. Who's familiar with both of those? Pretty much everybody. Okay, if you're not, or it's been a little while since you've used NumPy or numerical uh, numerical methods for Python, spend some time refamiliarizing yourself with NumPy this week. Matplotlib, uh, it's been around for a long time. It's not ideal, but it is sort of the gold standard in most science and engineering projects for visualizing data. You're gonna be using Matplotlib in assignment four to visualize the incoming sensory information to your robot. So again, if you haven't used matplotlib before or it's been a while, refamiliarize yourself with matplotlib. We're gonna be making very heavy use of NumPy and matplotlib as we continue on with the assignments. This is a good time to refamiliarize yourself with those. Okay, sensors, uh, motors to follow, graduate students, you're moving on to uh, neurons and synapses. Uh, when you finish assignment eight, you are going to close the sense, think, act cycle, which we've talked about a few times already. We will mention it many more times in this course. Information comes in to your robot. Neurons and synapses, as we saw when we talked about uh, artificial neural networks last week, transform values arriving at, in our case, the sensor neuron layer, the first layer of the neural network. Your sensors, your neurons and synapses are gonna transform that sensory information and possibly combine it with memories that your robot already has and those transformed incoming values are gonna be sent to the motors. Motors apply force, which in our case is going to be torque or rotational force. The values arriving at the motor neurons are gonna apply rotational force to the joints, and the joints are gonna try and rotate links relative to one another. So for grad students, when you're finishing assignment eight, you're closing this loop that connects all of these pieces together. In the physics engine, which we're gonna talk about, we're gonna spend quite a bit of time talking about physics engines today, time passes in discrete chunks, as you've already seen in assignment one and two. At each time step of the simulation, values arrive at the robot's sensors, those values travel through the robot's neural network. Those values arrive at the motors. The motors apply forces at the joints to the links, which cause the links to change their positions and accelerations at the next time step. And your robot starts to make small movements from one time step to the next. Make sense? That's my best attempt to try and summarize all these bits and pieces of things we've talked about so far 
in this course. All good? Okay, I want to come back to joints for a moment. Um, uh, there was a little bit that was confusing in there. The first and most confusing thing about joints and links in PyBullet, the physics engine that we're using, is the juggling of absolute and re relative coordinates. If you're still confused about absolute and relative coordinates, come and see the TA and myself and we can walk you through that. The other com confusing element about joints is joint normals. And we talked about this last time. If we've got this link and this link attached by this joint, at the moment, the code base you're using sets the joint normal for you by default to a particular direction. The joint normal is a vector. And for every vector in three-dimensional space, there is one and only two-dimensional plane that is normal to that 3D vector, yeah? So if you set up all your links and joints correctly, what you should see is that the links in your simulation rotate through the vertical plane relative to one another, right? So you've got this three, uh, this three link robot, main body, front leg, back leg. You should see these three objects rotating relative to one another through the vertical plane that cuts through your robot. Okay, some of you may see something different, which is instead of this happening, and I can't demonstrate this with my upper and lower arm, let me do it with my hand and my lower arm, you might see this happening, meaning that the objects seem to be rotating about the long axis or the, the plane that cuts through these robots. That's not what we're looking for. If you see that, what that means is that when you set up your robot like this, you actually set it up like this. There are two horizontal axes in Pi Bullet, X and Y. You're supposed to be building along X and Z. If you build it along Y and Z, so you've got your robot like this, remember that the joint normals are set automatically by Pi Bullet. So if you build objects like this, the joint normal is still set by default by, in Pi Bullet like this, and you're going to see things rotating about this joint normal. So if you see objects twisting about one another or rolling around uh, about one another, go back and swap the two horizontal coordinates. Make sense? Okay. If you are seeing that and my explanation still didn't make sense to you, come and see the TA and myself and we'll sort everything out. Any other questions about the assignments so far? Links, joints, sensors, motors? All good? Okay. All right. So back to lecture. Uh, just to remind you, we're working our way through this th second theme of the course, the tools of the trade. What are all the bits and pieces that go into a basic evolutionary robotics experiment? We saw last week how neurons and synapses transform incoming sensory information for a robot into action. We almost finished lecture five last time. We'll finish it uh, shortly, which is how do we wrap a search process, in our case, an evolutionary algorithm, around a robot controlled by a neural network, such that that evolutionary algorithm is tinkering with the internal bits of the neural controller of the robot, such that the evolutionary algorithm finds a particular setting of synaptic weights that causes our robot to do whatever we want it to do. We'll finish that in a moment, and then we'll push on to lecture six, physical simulation. You've already already been doing a little bit uh, of work with physics engines. Uh, a lot of what's going on is actually hidden from you. We're going to look under the hood of the physics engine today to see what's going on. Okay, so back to evolutionary algorithms. Very quickly to remind you, when we look out at biological evolution, if we squint and approximate by huge orders of magnitude, you can view what's going on out there in nature as an algorithm. We have a population of diverse things. That diversity causes some of them to not survive long enough to produce offspring. Other aspects of diversity allow some members of the population to survive and produce randomly modified copies of themselves. That very, very short and crude description of biological evolution also describes more or less 
pretty much every evolutionary algorithm that's out there. And there are hundreds, if not thousands, of different kinds of evolutionary algorithms reported in the literature. Last time, we did a very quick crash course of visiting some of the most famous of them. In order to understand the pros and cons of those different evolutionary algorithms that we looked at, we introduced this uh, intuition pump or this thought experiment, which helps us think about what these evolutionary algorithms are doing, which is the fitness landscape. We introduced a very important distinction last time between genotype and phenotype. Genotype is some sort of information storage, and phenotype is uh, a readout of that information and an instantiation of that information. It becomes the thing, the form and function of the organism, or in this course, the form and function of the robot. Yeah? Okay. We looked at this progression of evolutionary algorithms by looking at, uh, by starting with the arguably the simplest one, the hill climber. You can code up a hill climber in about five or six lines of Python code, and you're going to do exactly that in assignment nine. Drawback of simplicity is it's a weak search method. Weak in what sense? What's wrong with the hill climber? It gets stuck on local optima, right? So we looked at the parallel hill climber. In order not to get stuck on hills, why don't we airdrop a whole bunch of different points at random horizontal positions in the fitness landscape, and they all act as hill climbers. It helps, but it doesn't guarantee that we're going to find the global optimum. Actually, no evolutionary algorithm guarantees that we're going to find the global optimum. We just try and do a better, increase that probability as best we can. We looked at the genetic algorithm, which is arguably the most famous evolutionary algorithm out there. So famous, in fact, that often the field of evolutionary algorithms is referred to as genetic algorithms. So if you hear these two terms, sometimes they're confused. It's important for us to remember genetic algorithms are just one type of evolutionary algorithm. What does the genetic algorithm have over parallel hill climbers? It introduces sex. We now can genetically recombine genetic material from two parents. That also reduces the probability that we're going to get stuck on a local optimum during search. We looked at the evolution strategy last time, which accelerates or decelerates horizontal jumps. So as evolution is searching, we can act at the evolutionary process can figure out how quickly or how slowly to move in different parts of the fitness landscape. If you are climbing mountains in heavy fog, if you are in a particular part of the mountain range that looks like this, you want to take small steps horizontally or you're going to find yourself in tr trouble. If you find yourself on very gradual slopes, you can speed up and take bigger steps. That's the intuition underlying the evolution strategy. We ended last time with genetic programming. Genetic programming is yet a different type of evolutionary algorithms. But we started by talking about the problem that made genetic programming famous, the problem that genetic programming was originally invented to solve. That problem is symbolic regression. We have a bunch of observations, and we want to search over the space of all possible equations that best describe the relationship in that data set. Uh, we motivated this by looking at an actual real-world problem that is near and dear to the hearts of anyone that lives in Chittenden County or thereabouts. Okay, we ended with this slide. I apologize, we went a little quickly last time through this. We just talked about the genotype to phenotype distinction. The genotype is some data structure that stores information about the phenotype, in our case, the robot. In the case of genetic programming, the phenotype is going to be the behavior of the equation. The genotype is going to be encoded not in a vector of numbers, which is what we usually see in an evolutionary algorithm. In genetic programming, what makes genetic programming unique is the genotype is stored as a tree data structure. There are some non-computer scientists in this class. Some of you have might, might not have come across tree data structures before. So we've got a cartoon example of how this works. 
We're going to start by building up a population of random candidate solutions to our problem, like we usually do in an evolutionary algorithm. Each individual in that population, or here are two different individuals in that population, we're going to build them at random by reaching into a bag that contains all of the operations that we think should be in the equation, but we don't really know how, and all of the state variables, nitrogen, phosphorus, turbidity in the water of Lake Champlain, whatever the actual independent variables are, the things that we can measure, we want to throw them into the bag as well, and some f random floating point numbers that are going to be sort of the raw material that genetic programming uses to build and then evolve these equations. We ended last time by randomly building parent one, the first individual in the population, by repeatedly re uh, reaching into this bag and grabbing at random operations or operands. And as we saw last time, we build up this particular tree, which represents what equation? So 0.8 plus x. 0 0.8 plus x yeah. times 1.4. Times 1.4. So this tree is encoding an equation, and the way to read this equation is to start at the top or the root of the tree and start walking down the left-hand side of that tree until we get to the end, 0.8, and then retracing our steps. 0.8 plus x. We keep walking up times 1.4. Here's a second random equation in the population, which again was constructed at random by repeatedly reaching into the bag of operations and operands. In this case, we randomly gra grabbed a division. Division requires two, uh, two arguments, so we kept reaching in the bag, and we made this equation, which is... mentally walk or traverse through this tree and you should be able to construct this equation in your head. Absolutely. So to write this out for us, this tree is encoding this equation. This tree is encoding this equation here. Yeah. Okay. All right. So once we have these equations, we can plug in our values for x and y in this case, which is going to give us back a curve, and we can see how closely that curve matches our, operation, uh, our actual observations, which are shown by the scatter plot. And I went, I went through this cartoon last time. We can see that this particular equation does a particularly poor job at matching the observations. So it would be assigned a low fitness and would probably be deleted from the population. This particular equation over here actually does a relatively good job of explaining or matching all the scatter points. It's got low error or high fitness. It's likely to survive in the population and produce randomly modified copies of itself. Equation, child equations that look similar to itself. Question? That's exactly the reason why. So the question was, why not just use a neural network to learn the relationship between, in this example here, x and y, and the dependent variable z? The reason why is, of course, a neural network can do a fantastic job of doing that. If you want insight into actually why algae is blooming at particular points in the lake, hard to get a neural network to tell you why. Not impossible. This is arguably the most active area of machine learning research, is get a neural network to learn the relationship and be able to explain it back to us poor human beings. Genetic programming was invented back in the 1990s for exactly this reason, is that assuming you know how to read equations, the equation should, in theory, give you insight into the problem. If you remember your high school algebra well enough, 
You should be able to look at this equation, not the graph, and know which value of x will minimize y. You know what kind of conditions in the lake, for example, are most likely to lead to an algal bloom. That's important, actionable information. Yeah? This is not a class on machine learning or interpretable machine learning. It's a great point. That's why it was invented. OK, so uh, in genetic programming, uh, we introduce mutation. So let's assume that these two individuals in the population did a relatively good job at matching our observations, better than other random equations in the population. Those other equations are killed off. These two survive, and we're going to allow these equations to produce child equations. We want to produce randomly modified copies of them. So we could take one or the other, let's take P1 for example, and start copying that tree into a new tree. And as we go, every once in a while, when we're copying one particular node, like this node for example, we're going to introduce a mutation. We snip out this node, and now we have a dangling arrow what do you think we do at this point? We're going to try and put some new random equation material where 1.4 used to be. How do we simulate mutation, do you think, in genetic programming, given what I've told you about GP so far? Um, are you going to put in a new node with like a new constant value? I guess you're not going to put on like a whole new branch. It's a great point. So we could say, well, there was a constant value here before, 1.4, so let's just tweak that value, 1.5, 1.21. Could do that, which is probably a good idea. It's making a slight change to the genotype, to the genetic encoding of the equation. Or we could just throw 1.4 again and reach in, start reaching into the bag and make a whole new tree. Your observation that you probably don't want to do that is a good observation. Why might you not want to do that? Um, if you are to like, if you are to add like a large number of like a three or more branch nodes, you know, a whole new operation, then that could like greatly decrease the um, evolutionary like value, especially because like it would be hard to figure out whether just removing that constant, or if one of those two variables um, caused it to like really decrease in um, like evolutionary value. Absolutely, great point. So if we were to make a large change to the genotype at this point, we're making we're adding quite a bit of new material or changing things quite a bit. Remember that P1 is a survivor. It survived in the population compared to the other ones that didn't do as good a job at explaining all our observations. So if you have a partly working machine, you probably don't want to go in with a sledgehammer and start making big changes to that partly working machine because you're most likely to break it. Right? It would be better to go in with tweezers and make a very small change. This rule about the magnitude of mutation, how much you change a child relative to its parent, is inversely proportional to the likelihood you're going to make a beneficial change. Said even sim more simply, the bigger the change, the more likely it's going to break things. Yeah. OK, great point. We're not going to go into that too much. This is not a class on evolutionary algorithms, but good observation. So we can introduce mutations when we're copying uh, equations by every once in a while when we're visiting a node, tweak it a little bit or delete it, added some new genetic material and hope for the best. In genetic programming, we can also simulate sexual recombination in addition to mutation. Let's see how that works. Uh, I've set this up for you already by introducing these two parent equations, which we're assuming have survived uh, up to this point in the, uh, in the population. And these two parents 
We're going to take genetic material from these two parents and recombine them to create two child equations down here. You can see that we've randomly chosen this point in parent one, and we've chosen this point at random in parent two. We take those two subtrees and we pull them off of their parents. We copy all the black material into C1 and C2. So C1 is inheriting this genetic material from its first parent. And this child is inheriting this genetic material from its parent. We're going to take these two detached pieces of genetic material, these two pieces of genome, and swap them. This piece from parent one gets placed here on child two. This piece of genetic material from parent two is placed here on child one. You don't need to madly copy down all of this. You should be able from this description to do it at your leisure. What I want you to see here, and I apologize that it's at the bottom of the screen here. Let me pop out for a minute. What you should be able to see down here, if I can get rid of my, I'll ignore my speaker notes here. You can see down here that the equation for C1 looks similar to, but is not identical to parent one. And the child equation C2 looks similar to, but is not identical to parent one. <coughs> Question. Um, is this like drastically decreases the accuracy of the functions? Would you um, like go back to the previous version of both of the functions and then tune it even less? Okay, that's a great question. So let's continue this hypothetical example. We have these two parents that survived up to this point in the evolutionary algorithm. At this, in this new generation, they've just spawned two new children, C1 and C2. So in this population, at this new generation, there are four individuals, P1, P2, C1, C2, and some other equations. We've made some pretty big changes to C1 and C2. And as you just mentioned, and as we just discussed, that means the likelihood that C1 and C2 are going to do as good a job as P1 and P2 at explaining the data, or even do a better job, that probability is pretty low. C1 and C2 are probably going to be assigned very low fitness values because they're probably going to suffer high error. What do you think genetic, the genetic programming algorithm is going to do at that point, at the next generation? That's it, right? We're back to P1 and P2. They keep generating C1 and C2. As you pointed out, P1 and P2 might have to stick around for quite a while until they eventually produce children that are as good, if not better, than themselves. There is. There are hundreds of papers that have been published about how to ensure that this big genetic change is constrained so that it has less of an impact on C1 and C2. It's very similar, actually, in spirit to our discussion about evolution strategies, where evolutionary evolution strategies were designed to make sure that individuals move horizontally a small distance relative to their parent. Remember that in a fitness landscape, horizontal distance represents the genetic distance you are away from another individual. It's a non-trivial thing to constrain genetic programming to do that. It's a great question. If people are interested, email me and I'll, I'll email you back some papers and you can dig into that literature. Okay, we're going to push on so we can talk about physics engines today. Uh, here's a fun example of genetic programming. Up till now, we've been talking about genetic programming evolving equations. One of the nice things about encoding genotypes as trees rather than vectors as the, is these trees can grow bigger, smaller, have different shapes. You can encode more or less genetic information, and that genetic information that's encoded in the tree doesn't necessarily have to be an equation. Here's an example of genetic programming that is not encoding 
uh, it's not encoding equations. What I'm showing you is the phenotype, the thing that's produced by each genotype in this evolving population of genotypes in this particular application of genetic programming. As you can see, the phenotype are little pictures. What do you think the genotypes are? How is genetic programming encoding these pictures in a tree? There's some clues embedded in the way that genetic programming is going to evolve images here. Any ideas? Nate? Maybe it's subdividing triangles? Subdividing triangles, that's one idea. Let's have a video, let's watch it in action. Okay, I don't think we need the fancy music. Here we go. You're watching, uh, if you can read this, you can see generations elapsing up here. So we're watching one run of genetic programming. And at every frame in this video, you're seeing the best tree in the population at that time. You're seeing actually the phenotype produced by the best tree in the population at that time. How do you think these trees are encoding this phenotype or these phenotypes? Um, possibly for like the reward function, it could go like pixel by pixel or it could like um, find certain subregions and see um, how close it is to this original image. Um, and then... Can I just pause you for one moment? So what you just described is great. It's the fitness function. Remember, we always compute fitness on the phenotype. So we have a phenotype on the right-hand side of this image. We take that phenotype and we overlay it on the actual image of the Mona Lisa. And we look at the differences in colors between pairs of lined up pixels. And the sum of those differences is the fitness. The closer the match, the higher the fitness of that phenotype. Sorry, you were saying. Um, and does it also like maybe have like each generation make like a hundred random triangles at these different, um, these different like X and Y positions? maybe like vectorizing them and like it sees which of those has the greatest fitness and then it takes that one and just adds triangles every single generation. Close. Remember there's nothing here except mutation and recombination. So we've just got 300 trees in the population. Each tree produces its own image. Other ideas? Something about like where the triangles overlap or something like that. I'm trying to decide where the it's true. It's like parent child structure is, but to do the overlap. It's hard it's a it's a little hard to see from this. I would invite you to go and watch the video on your own screen. What it's actually doing, this tree is encoding in a whole bunch of subtrees, polygons, not quite triangles, but close enough. So a subtree has a whole bunch of nodes inside of it. Those nodes uh, in that subtree correspond to each point in the polygon and that each individual node encodes two numbers, the two-dimensional coordinate of that node of the polygon. So if we have a tree that's made up of 13 subtrees, that genotype is encoding 13 polygons. As you can probably guess from this uh, video, each of those subtrees also contains a little bit of additional information aside from just the positions of the nodes, which is color, color and alpha value. alpha value. What's alpha value for those that don't know? <clears throat> alpha value is like transparency. The amount of transparency, absolutely, right? So you can see that an individual tree with uh, a whole bunch of different subtrees can put a whole bunch of different polygons on top of one another. It can color them differently. 
increase or decrease the transparency, add or remove nodes to a polygon, and relatively quickly come up with a pretty good approximation of the Mona Lisa. Why would you do such a thing? The answer is obvious, no, because it's fun. <laughs> okay. One other observation from this is in a relatively short period of time, you get a pretty good approximation of the Mona Lisa. If you take that tree, which encodes all those polygons that approximates the Mona Lisa, and you apply uh, a compression algorithm to it, you take that same compression algorithm and apply it to this, what do you think happens? The tree value is probably even smaller. Or the, the, space too smaller. the tree is actually more compressible. It's not the most efficient way to do it, but you, this is a way to actually come up with a compressible description of the Mona Lisa. Okay, for our purposes, it's just meant to be a visual, uh, a visual representation of how genetic programming is working. Okay, that concludes our discussion about evolutionary algorithms. Any questions before we push on? All right, shifting mental gears. Here we go. We're going to talk about physics engines, the things that you're going to use to simulate uh, each individual robot that your evolutionary algorithm dreams up. Let's go back to the 1980s when computer graphics was just getting off the ground. How was computer graphics done in those days? If you wanted to make a 2D or 3D representation uh, of a physical scene, you would do it as follows. As the computer graphics programmer, you would manually uh, figure out and then define in your code the position of all of the objects that make up your three-dimensional scene, the orientation of those objects how are they orientated in three-dimensional space, the shape, and so on. Then you'd click render, and your computer would more or less take a snapshot of that 3D screen, save it, uh, that 3D scene, save it to a file. You would then go back in, change the position and orientation of the objects that make up the scene, click render again, it would save out a file. And if you wanted to simulate, for example, a single sphere, uh, accelerating towards the ground, it took a fair bit of work to do. As you can imagine, it didn't take very long for computer graphics researchers to get pretty fed up of this approach and try and dream up something easier, which is instead of manually defining all of the traits, all of the features of every object in your scene, let the computer do it for you. The moment that was done, physics engines were born. So let's contrast a very simple physical simulator to a computer graphics program. In a physics engine, as you've already done, you have to start at the beginning. You have to do some work up front. You still have to define the initial position of objects that make up the scene. You have to define the orientation of those objects. You have to define the shape. And then you have to do some additional work that you didn't actually have to do in computer graphics, which is also define the physical properties of these objects, the mass of the object, the friction of the object, what happens if, of, if, the, surface, if the surface of this object comes into contact with the surface of another object. You've got to do a fair bit of work up front. You have to define how these objects are attached together and so on. That's what you're doing in assignments one, two, th and three. Once you've done all that work, you can then recoup all that effort by instead of having to click render and redefine all those values for the next time step of the simulation, the simulation will now take over and update <coughs> the positions update the positions and orientations of all of the objects for you. How a physics engine does that is actually fantastically complicated, but at heart, there is one important equation that takes care of most of this, which is hopefully something that's familiar to most of you, F equals MA. A is acceleration, um, and 
In our case, we're going to be working in a three-dimensional virtual environment. So acceleration is going to be a three-dimensional vector. Again, remember your high school uh, physics class, perhaps, where acceleration represents the speed, the rate of change of speed in the horizontal direction, the y direction, and the z direction. Yeah, That's linear acceleration. There is also the rate of change in the speed of the change of the orientation of the object. This is usually known as a yaw, pitch, and roll. Let's see if I can do this right. So I'm an airplane. This is roll. Pitch is my nose goes up, my nose goes down, which leaves yaw, which is I rotate about the axis sticking out, out from, a under me, uh, from above me. Yeah? So that's rotational acceleration. So we need three numbers to tell us how the x, y, and z uh, velocity of the object is changing. We need an additional three numbers, which is how the, I won't act it out, how the yaw, pitch, and roll velocities are also changing. So in a physics engine, at every time step, that physics engine is computing all of the forces that are acting on every object, and we'll come back to forces in a moment. And the physics engine knows the masses of the objects. You define those masses for it. The physics engine can rearrange this equation into A equals F divided by M. So the physics engine takes all the forces and the masses of the objects and works out these six numbers. What, are, what is the change in the positions of, uh, the position of the object and what is the change in its orientation. This is a physics engine in a nutshell. If I've lost you at this point, let me know. So far so good? Okay. All right, so that's acceleration. For our purposes, you can think of this as six numbers. Uh, Masses are scalars for the moment. We're just assigning a number. This object weighs three kilograms. This one measures, uh, uh, has, is 30 kilograms, and so on. Force is also made up of six numbers. Here's my object. We mentioned torque already. Torque is rotational force. So at every time step, at every time step, the physics engine visits each object that makes up your scene and looks to see which forces are acting on that object. In this simple example here, there is one and only one force acting on the object, which is, I can see some of you mouthing it, it's gravity, right? So gravity is pulling on this object and altering its linear acceleration. It's pulling it down. The Z coordinate of linear acceleration is going to be negative at each time step due to gravity pulling it down. Yeah? So what does that do as we go from one time step to the next? At time step t, the object we, uh, that we started at, we place the object at this position. At time step t plus 1, the physics engine has run f equals ma and figured out that the linear acceleration downwards is positive. The physics engine takes that acceleration and applies it to the, the old position of the object to come up with the new position of the object, which is downward by a little bit. Yeah? Okay. At the next time step, it does the same thing and the same thing, and the, the position of this object changes, 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 until it hits the ground and it stops moving. Why? Why does the object stop moving? from the physics engine's point of view. Suddenly there's a number of equal forces acting. Absolutely. So the physics engine is going to detect that two objects have come into contact with one another at time step t plus n. And now the physics engine is going to add two forces to that object. One force pulling the object down, which is gravity. And then the physics engine, again, you don't see any of this, is going to add an additional force pushing up against the object with equal magnitude. 
You plug those two opposing forces in to this equation, what do you get back as A? They cancel out, and this thing suddenly decelerates and comes to a stop resting on the ground. Yeah? Most of everything that's going on in a physics engine is computing F equals MA over and over and over again. So far, so good? Okay. Uh, what we're going to do now uh, in the next few slides is actually look at some pseudocode. You don't need to remember any of this pseudocode. Um, some of you that are paying attention see that there are semicolons here, which is a reminder to some of you that you're now not looking at Python code, you're looking at C code. When I started this course, we were working with the Open Dynamics Engine physics engine rather than PyBullet. Uh, op the Open Dynamics Engine is written in C. I am not going to torture any of you by having to write physics engine code in C. Be thankful you're taking this class in 2024. But I put it up here as a reminder of one of the main concepts in this course, which is tools come and go, but basic concepts remain. Yeah? So, Lots of different physics engines, they're all doing more or less the same thing. So let's have a look at the preliminary. So in ODE and in PyBullet, as we mentioned, you need to do some work up front. In ODE, there were a couple of lines uh, of code that would set up the virtual world, um, that would set the gravitational force in this world. You can set it to minus 9.8. If you want to simulate things that are happening on this planet, you can set it to different values. If you're prototyping a rover for NASA, that's going to send your probe to planetary bodies that have a different gravitational force. You can also set uh, different parameters that have to do with friction for all the objects in the world uh, and so on. We're not going to talk about uh, these other preliminaries first. This is just a reminder. We can tune the physics of the physics engine up front if we want. Okay. We then have to create a whole bunch of links that are the physical objects in our physics engine. In ODE, they were not called links. They're called uh, bodies. We need to do a few things for each body or link that we add to our physics engine. You've already done this, like for example, setting the position, initial position of the object. In ODE, the second coordinate was the height coordinate. In Pi Bullet, the third coordinate is the vertical coordinate, right? I still confuse myself about this one. Okay. All right. So as we can see here in this cartoon example, we're starting by setting an object six meters above the ground. You'll notice when we set the position, there are no units associated with uh, these uh, quantities. Units is kind of hidden from you by the physics engine. So again, in this course, we're not going to worry about whether this, is, this object is initially placed six meters above the ground, six feet above the ground, six microns above the ground. It doesn't really matter for our purposes. Okay. In ODE, you also you could set the mass of the object, which is usually just one number. In ODE, you could distribute that mass across the length, width, and height of the object. So you could actually make interesting mass distributions inside an object. Maybe you want to simulate an object in which inside that object there's one heavy component on inside one part of the object. It's a detail, it's not important uh, for us. Okay, some other parameters that we're not going to worry about. So we're setting position and mass of the object. We can also set the, or, the 3D, initial 3D orientation of objects uh, in, uh, in your scene. This is a little complicated. So uh, in PyBullet and PyroSim, I've hidden this detail from you. When you create a cube uh, in uh, PyroSim, it's placed with a particular orientation. You cannot, at the outset, set the orientation to be something different in your uh, simulation. If you find you want to do that, or you have to do that when you get to your final project, here's a link to tips and tricks, which are at the end of all of the learning modules in our subreddit. So there's additional things you can do. I want to just talk through how you, how you do this in general, 
just to again give you a sense of what's going on under the hood of a physics engine. Let's imagine we have a rectangular solid like you see here, and we want to try and set its orientation in space. There are a lot of different ways to do this. Some of these are more complicated than others. Some of you may have heard of quaternions before. We're not going to go into too much detail about them here, um, but I'm going to give you an intuition for how this works. If we have a rectangular solid, we can take three of those numbers to define a, ve a vector in three-dimensional space. We can tell the physics engine to take that rectangular solid, find its longest length. So if it's got different length, width, and height, find the longest one, which is the long axis of the rectangular solid, and place it so that that long axis is lying along that 3D vector. So far, so good. The fourth vector, as you can probably guess from the fact that we're using theta, theta, is a rotational directive. It tells us then how to take that object and rotate it about its long axis, which is lying along this three-dimensional axis. So far, so good. With those four numbers, you can define any three-dimensional orientation for our object. Why is that important? Remember that in uh, F equals MA, what your physics engine is doing is summing up all of the forces and torques that are acting on your object. We've got three numbers for force, which is how much, uh, how much that force is pushing or pulling on the linear acceleration of the object. Torque is a rotational force, which is trying to alter the rotational acceleration of your object. So at every point in time, the physics engine is updating not just the position of your object, but also its orientation in three-dimensional space. If for some reason you need to set the orientation yourself at the beginning, you would normally do it with quaternions. So far, so good? Okay, we saw an example of gravitational force, which is an example of a linear force acting on objects in your physics engine. What kinds of torques are acting on your links? What are, the, what, are the, what are the rotational forces that cause the orientation of your links to change from one time step to the next in your physics engine? Motors? Absolutely. A motor attached to a joint, a motor attached to a joint is applying rotational force, is applying torque to try and alter the three-dimensional orientation of the pairs of objects that are attached by the joint. So if there are links, if there are links that are connected by a joint, that link may be acted on by a linear force like gravity that's trying to pull it down and torques. The physics engine is summing up all of those linear and rotational forces to compute the new linear acceleration and rotational acceleration acting on each object. Physics engine finishes that time step by using the linear and rotational acceleration to compute the new position and the new orientation of each object. Question? Oh, that's all. I was going to say that um, the weight of the connected link is also the torque. The weight of the connected link absolutely can be a, uh, uh, actually can be a torque. Absolutely. In this physics engine, we're assuming that links are massless. They're invisible. They have no mass. The only thing that have masses are links. Sensors and motors and joints in the physics engine you're using, Pi Bullet, have no mass. If you want to approximate, if you want to make a more physically realistic robot, you could put a link sitting right here and connect this link to this link and then connect this link to this link to better simulate a motorized joint in a robot. Okay, any questions about that so far? Okay, we need four numbers if we want to specify the three-dimensional orientation of an object in a physics engine. If we've got a cylinder, 
We only need three numbers. Why? Yep. Uh, yes. The rotation doesn't matter, right? So if you look at my pen, obviously three of the numbers matter. I need to set the yaw, pitch, and roll of this object. But once I set it, this fourth number in a quaternion theta, if I apply different thetas, assuming there's no actual complex pattern on the surface of the cylinder, it doesn't matter. How many numbers do I need to specify the orientation of a sphere? in a physics engine? In the red hoodie in the back there. The orientation. The, the orientation. I want to set the orientation of the sphere. Zero. I don't need any. It doesn't matter. For a sphere, I set the three-dimensional position, and we're done, right? It doesn't actually matter. Assuming, again, the surface is uniform, it doesn't matter how we rotate it in space. Now, a physics engine absolutely will apply torques and uh, li uh, rotational linear forces to a sphere and cause it to rotate as it's moving through 3D space in a physics engine. It's not really going to have much of an impact on the physics. How would that be affected if you started adding joints to your lifts? It gets very complicated very quickly, right? On a specific part of it, right? And so then the orientation would matter? Yes, absolutely. So let's go back to my arm as an example. We've got this link attached to this link by a rotational joint. And let's say I set this is the initial position and orientation, and this is the initial position and orientation of these two links. I set them before I start the simulation running. Once the simulation starts running, for torques and forces start to act, and the positions and orientations of these two objects start to change. I'm applying rotational force to these two objects, and I'm also counteracting the linear force of gravity that's pulling them down. If you look at my lower arm, you can see that the linear acceleration and rotational acceleration of this object is changing in complicated ways. It's very, 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 very difficult to work these all out by hand. That's why physics engines were invented. You don't need to. OK, so each link still has four values for orientation. You just only need like three to set for itself. Absolutely. Great point. Every object, regardless of its shape, has three numbers specifying its position in space. It's got four numbers specifying its orientation in space. It also has three numbers representing how quickly or how slowly it's moving through space. And it has another three numbers specifying how quickly and how slowly it's rotating through space. All of those numbers change at every, or can change at every instant in time in a physics engine. And all of those numbers are hidden from you. Unless you need those numbers, which we're going to see in a moment there are cases in which you do. So far, so good? OK, let's keep going. OK, uh, we've actually already talked about this, so hopefully this is going to be a little bit uh, familiar and a reinforcement for you. Again, we're looking at C code from a different physics engine, so you can ignore a lot of the actual details here. What I want you to pay attention to is the fact that we're now creating a joint which connects together two different objects. In this case, we are attaching a particular type of uh, joint called a hinge joint, which are the kinds of joints we're going to be using in this class. They affect how objects rotate relative to one another. We talked about setting the position of the joint. In ODE, the position of a joint is called its anchor. And the three-dimensional position of a joint also starts to move once the physics engine starts running. You have to set the position of that joint at the beginning of the simulation, and then the physics engine does everything from there. Yeah? It is an invisible, massless, extensionless object, meaning it has no orientation, just position in space. You then also have to set the axis 
otherwise known as the joint normal, which we already talked about uh, in this class. We just talked about how this is set manually and hidden from you. Most of the time this makes your life easier unless you do something differently, which then causes your robot to act mysteriously. If you wanna unlock joint normals and play around with them, you can jump ahead to learning module N in the subreddit and give it a try. This was my best attempt to try and draw in three-dimensional space two objects with a vertical joint normal, which causes these two objects to rotate about X and Z. Yeah? Just as a reminder, if I have these two objects and I define this joint normal, there is one 2D plane that is normal to this 3D vector. I apologize for repeating this several times, but it's worthwhile getting this straight in your head before your robot gets more complicated with lots more links and joints and relative and absolute coordinates. Okay, all right. The one aspect of a physics engine, or one of the big parts of a physics engine that we have not talked about until now is uh, detecting and resolving collisions. So collisions in a physics engine, there are two parts that the physics engine needs to deal with. Detecting collisions, have a pair of objects come into contact with one another, and resolving collisions. What should the physics engine do when it's detected a collision? Okay, so how does this uh, work? Let's actually just ignore uh, the, the code for a moment. Let's assume we make a physics engine where we've got a whole bunch of bouncing balls None of them are connected together with joints. So we've got, in the case of pi bullet, you would have nine links and zero joints. Yeah. Okay, they all start bouncing around and hitting the ground, and maybe a few of, the, uh, a few of these spheres might come close together and actually come into contact with one another. How does the physics engine detect this, and how does it deal with this? If these nine links happen to be spheres, it's super simple. How does the physics engine know when two spheres have come into contact with one another? Absolutely. So we've got it's going to the physics engine is going to look at pairs of spheres. And as you said, the physics engine knows the XYZ for this sphere and the XYZ for this sphere. How does it know whether they, those spheres have collided or not? Uh, if their radius is to their maximum location and each other. Absolutely, right? So we have these two spheres. <laughs> we know the radii of these two spheres because the user specified, the user specified uh, the, the size of those object, the size of that object at the beginning of the simulation. So we sum those two radii. So if we've got this position and this position, and we sum those two radii, if that sum, if the, or, uh, I'm sorry, I take that back. If we take, we take the distance between the centers of the two objects, and if that distance between these two centers is less than the sum of the two radii, these objects have collided and are possibly interpenetrating one another already. It's a big no-no in a physics engine. Physics engine doesn't like that very much. So far, so good? Okay, so in order to do that, in the, this case of nine, uh, nine spheres, how many potential collisions does the physics engine need to look for? It knows the positions and radii of all nine of these spheres at this particular point in the physical simulation. Two to the nine. Two to the nine, that's one yeah. guess. Would it be uh, eight or nine factorial? Eight or nine factorial, any other guesses? How do we, how do we get to these equations? Well, let's put ourselves in the shoes of the physics engine. Oh, deep breath. Pick one of the nine and compare the position of this against each of the other eight spheres and detect whether or not the sphere is in contact with any of these eight. 
Okay, so that's eight collisions we've just considered. Let's go to the second of the nine spheres. How many collision, potential collisions do we need to detect in this case? Or consider? Seven, right? One of them we've already done. If object I is in contact with object J, by definition, object J is, already in, is also in contact with object A. So you mentioned factorial, right? We need to consider eight, then seven, then six, then five, then four, then three, then two, then one potential collisions, which is how many? Okay. We've got N objects, and we need to consider its potential collision with every other one of the n minus one objects, but because of the symmetry, we can get away with doing half as many. If we've got nine spheres in our simulation, how many collisions are we talking about? 36, okay. At every time step in this particular simulation, the physics engine needs to consider 36 possible collisions. Rewind your mental tape to when you were creating these towers. I forget how many links were involved in that. Does anybody remember? Fifty? There were 25 towers. Each tower was made up of 25 towers and how many, sorry? So there were 250 links in that physical simulation. At every time step when that simulation was running on your laptop, how many collisions was Pi Bullet considering? You can see the eyes rolling back into your head for some of you, right? It's, it's a big number. Yeah. How many of you started to hear the fan going on on your laptop when you simulated those 25 uh, towers? This, this is why. So again, some of these details are not that important for us, but it's good to really know what's going on under the hood. When you run a physics engine, the vast majority of work that that physics engine is doing is detecting potential collisions. It's super complicated to do. If we've got spheres, as we just said, it's relatively easy. The algorithm is running a relatively, the physics engine is running a, a relatively simple algorithm to detect for each of those potential collisions whether a collision is happening or not. What about two cubes? If we replace these nine spheres with nine cubes, we still have to detect, or the physics engine still needs to look for <coughs> this many potential pairwise collisions. How is the physics engine determining whether two cubes are in contact with one another or not. It can, I mean, it can just do the same thing as the spheres, just with a slightly more complicated calculation to find the outer bounds. Yes, it is a, it is a more complicated, it can't just take the distance right. between the centers of those two cubes. It's more complicated. And you've got to run that more complicated algorithm this many times. Now your fan is really running on your laptop. Yeah, this is where this is why physics engines took a long time to get right, and why they're so computationally uh, they're they're computation they're computation hogs. Yeah. Okay. So one additional detail, which again is hidden from you um, in physics engines, is something known as collision spaces, and I kind of breezed over this. Uh, when we introduce the preliminaries here. So we're gonna talk about collision spaces for a moment. Let's, in this case, we've placed all of our nine links in one and only one collision space. What that does, we're telling the physics engine that at every point in time, please look at all of these potential collisions and resolve them. Don't let these spheres interpenetrate one another. Let's imagine a slightly more, a slightly different simulation. We still have nine links and zero joints, but we know for some reason that these objects tend to be close to one another, and these links tend to be close to one another, and they're usually not very close to one another. Maybe we're gonna simulate two robot swarms. 
What we can do is define two different collision spaces and put these links, which tend to be close to one another in this space, and put these objects in this second space. I'm going to stop explaining collision spaces for a moment and see if you can guess the rest of the intuition behind collision spaces. Why are we doing this? Absolutely, right? So in the case where we have just one collision, uh, where we have just one collision space, we had nine objects times eight divided by two, which is 36 potential collisions. If we place these objects in these two different spaces, how many collisions do it, does the physics engine now need to deal with? Can we do better than that? The physics engine can actually use these collision spaces to, to get away with actually, most of the time, doing much less than 16 collisions. How? I just feel like if the distance is too great from, from computer. If the distance of what? Uh, any pair. Uh, Possibly, possibly. There are other things you can do that say, when they're really far apart, I'm going to do a preliminary calculation. I'll only do a more complicated one when they're closer. So I don't know the exact details of this, but I know that in games, what they mostly use is tree-based collision. Yep. So they'll basically dynamically create collision groups based on what is in proximity with what else, and they'll dynamically rearrange the binary tree according to that. Absolutely. So this tree-based collision detection that you mentioned, this is a simpler version of it. In state-of-the-art video games, they use dynamic trees. We're going to use a static one. We've created, you can think of this as a tree where we've got our world as the root, and then we've got two subtrees, which are these two spaces. At any given point in time in this physics engine, the, uh, in, the, in the virtual world, the physics engine is going to look to see whether these two cubes come into contact with one another, these two spaces. If these two spaces, if these two cubes that are wrapped around these two groups do not come into contact with one another, what can the physics engine get away with? 16. I'm sorry, I misspoke. So this doesn't let it do less than 16. It lets it do less than 36. So it's just, at this particular point in time, it's done one collision detection between these two cubes. Yeah? Assuming the, the, these two cubes don't collide, it's got to do each of the pairwise collisions inside here. 4 times 3 divided by 2. And it's got to do pairwise detection of all of the collisions in this box. For each of the five, does it collide with any of the other four, uh, other four spheres in space two divided by two? That's how many collisions it needs to compute. At the next time step, imagine these spheres and their respective collision spaces have moved a little bit. And now at this new time step, when the physics engine looks to see whether space one and space two are in collision with one another and finds that they are in collision with one another, what does the physics engine have to do now? Merge the two spaces effectively. It all. It's got to merge the two spaces, and unfortunately, it's got to do all of them. Yeah? So there is a fantastically complicated literature, and you mentioned this, mostly in the computer graphics and computer games communities, about how to reduce the computational burden of, collect, of collision detection, the most computationally painful step that the physics engine needs to perform during each time step. So far, so good? OK, we've got two minutes left. So let's finish. Uh, let's finish with um, collision resolution. <laughs>
What happens when during any given time step, the physics engine finds that two objects actually are in collision with one another? In most physics engines, they introduce a little bit of event-based programming. And again, not everyone in this class has come across this concept before. Most of the time, when you write a computer program, the computer goes to the first line of your code, executes that line, goes to the next one, next one, next one, next one, enters a loop, and marches through each line of your code one after the other. In event-based programming, sometimes as the computer is leisurely moving from one step to the next, there's an event that happens from somewhere outside the execution of your code. And that causes your computer to leave whatever line in your code it's currently executing and immediately jump to some other part of your code to handle that event. Events that are very important in a physics engine are these kind of events. So at, during an individual time step in a physical simulation, if a pair of objects are detected to be in collision with one another, this part of your code, the physics engine's code, uh, takes over and it says, what do you want me to do, boss? What do I do? These objects are in collision with one another. You usually have to write that code. Again, in this class, I've written that code for you. It's going to be taken care of automatically. The first thing this code asks is, are the two bodies, or in our case, the two links that have been detected in collision with one another, are they, are, are they, are they uh, connected together by a joint? If they are, what do you think the physics engine does? It doesn't care. It leaves this piece of code that is resolving the collision. It ignores the collision. Right? That collision is supposed to be happening. It's actually a good thing. Yeah? So there's usually a bunch of if statements inside this part of your code that resolves collisions that say, if it's this type of collision, ignore it. If it's this type of collision, ignore it. So on and so on. We're out of time, so we will continue our discussion of collision resolution uh, next time. You have a quiz due tonight. Undergrads, you're working on uh, sensors. Grad students, you're working on neurons and synapses. See you on Thursday. <laughs>